for doing that today. And, and I'm going to make, there is, you know, perhaps um, the Holy Spirit made me forget. Um, and why I say that, because it, I'm going to be talking about something, inheritance, that I think you're going to find interesting, that it's sort of bringing it together here to a point. Um, you know, the last couple of weeks have been quite profound in my life. Um, we, as you know, when I shared, I had a close friend that was, uh, um, that I went to see because he was diagnosed with having terminal cancer. And some of you know this story. I flew out quite quickly. I found out, he found out a week ahead of me finding out. And then I immediately booked a flight and went to go visit him and talk to him about spirituality. I grew up with him. He was a Christian and, uh, and he really strayed away from that foundation of faith that was in his heart that I, when I knew him back when I was a teenager. And we talked about some spiritual things that I felt strongly that God told me to tell him. You know, sometimes when we think about God telling us to tell, you know, stuff, you know, we get this idea like there's this little whisper, like God's got a little angel or, or himself and he's just whispering in your ear. And I find that when God speaks to us, it's a, there's a number of ways to do it, does it? One of those ways is just this internal sense in your soul of what you need to do. Now, friends, that always, every time, whenever you say, well, God told me to do this, it always lines up with scripture. Is this scriptural? Is this good? If what I'm doing right now where God says, oh yeah, you need to do this thing, does it line up with what God, how he acts and operates? And we always have to evaluate that. So I went and visited my friend. And I, I sh you know, shared with him this stuff. So I found out this week that uh, his dad called me and he's passed away. So by the time he was diagnosed with finding out that he had cancer, I went to go see him and then him passing away, it was one month. You know, and, and I was reflecting on that this week as I was going to be talking to you today because it kind of coincides with another thing that we did this last week called uh, two weeks ago called Be Prepared. We had a finance seminar that was going on here at All Nations Church. And it was really talking about like what happens, you know, are you prepared for what might happen if you were to pass away? That was a lot of it, right? We talked about wills. We talked about, you know, lawyer and the implications of that. We talked about how do you finance us. We even talked about some stuff that, you know, if, if you're starting out on your journey and how do you get into a house and there's a new home plan that we, we talked about all kinds of stuff. But you know, my friend passing away and the seminar, it just all pinnacled to one point. And that was this in my mind is that, are you doing the things that you need to do? The most important things that you need to do because you never know what's going to happen. We're going to be talking today about another villain in the Bible. But in order to start that, I wanted you to think about this idea of inheritance, of birthrights. What happens when you die? And, you know, as I was preparing today, I, I was looking for what was some of the oddest inheritance um, last will sort of moments. And I, I found a bunch of these. And I think you guys might get a kick out of these. So not too long ago, there was a dog named Trouble. That's an appropriate name, I think, because the dog received $12 million from her, her, his, her owner, uh, billionaire hoteler Leona Helmsley. Now, interestingly enough, when she got that actually reduced the amount by quite a bit because the dog needed to go into hiding uh, amid death and kidnap threats. <laughs> Poor trouble, hey? All right, men, you might appreciate this. Ladies, not so much. Heinrich Henry Hein, who left his estate to his wife, Matilda, in 1856, on, and this was in the will, on the condition that she remarry so that there will be at least one man to regret my death. <laughs> oh, that's harsh, eh? <laughs> Woo. Okay, here's another one. Portuguese aristocrat, Luis Carlos, wrote on his will, he left his considerable fortune to 70 strangers randomly chosen out of a Lisbon phone directory. Literally went through the phone directory. <laughs> boop, boop, 70 people. This is what I liked. Uh, when Henry Budd died, his will, will expressly forbade his two sons from growing mustaches. If either William or Edward sprouted a handlebar, his share of the inheritance would be voided and revert to whichever son had remained clean-shaven. 
Woo. So I think it leads to this question. If you, right now, I want you to think about this thought. If you inherited the family business and it was worth millions of dollars, millions of dollars, would you walk away from it and just forget about it? If you inherited the family business and, and don't get too, don't get processing it too much here. Well, I don't know. I mean, you know, is there a lot of work involved or do I like my mom? I don't <laughs> think about that stuff right now. I just want to know generally here, if you inherited the family business and it was worth millions of dollars, would you walk away and give it up? Do I see a single hand? Wow. Not a single hand. Okay, good. I, I would assume that as well, right? So not a single person would give up millions of dollars of an inherited family business. So today, you know, we're going to be talking about someone that actually very much did that in the Bible. You know, we've been in a series right now called Villains of the Bible. And I think the question is, why are there villains in the Bible? Like, isn't the Bible about God and good and all that stuff? And, and, and the Bible is a collection of stories that do point a picture of who God is from the very beginning in Genesis to the very end and what is to come. It paints this giant picture of just the, who the character of God is and how mankind interacts with God. This big story of redemption that goes on and built into it at the very end is the fact that he continues to want to love and have relationship with us. So these villains in the Bible, while they might not be talking about God's character, they do talk about how they in some ways have failed or have been less than what God had intended for people. And when we look at them as villains, we look at them as a character study and they're there because I think they point to us and they give us the opportunity to live vicariously through situations where they do something and this is the consequence of that happening. And so when we watch these characters go, well, then I maybe don't want to do that very thing so that I don't face those same consequences. And that's a li- really a lot of the reason why these tragic characters are in the Bible and why tragic characters are so popular as genre for humanity. Now, the character we're going to be looking at today, I wouldn't consider a villain. I would consider this to be a tragic character. A decision that was made and decisions that were made that led to poor consequences and choices. And as we want to look at this character today, I want you to begin to reflect upon how we might conduct our own lives in the light of this character. It's a tragedy of Esau. So let's look at his story. And we find this in the book of Genesis, the very beginning of the Bible, chapter 25. I encourage you, if you have your Bibles, to turn to that. It's always good to try to figure out where things are at times. It gets that process, that learning into our spirits and our beings if you're online, but the story goes on beyond what we're going to be talking about today. So this is Genesis 25, and we're talking about Esau. So when the time came for her to give birth, this is um, the mother, obviously, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So he named, he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. I know we got some guys in here like that, right? Parents, right? Yeah. The boys grew up and Esau became a skillful, skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau. Isaac is his dad. He loved Esau. But Rebekah loved Jacob. Mom loved the other son. Once when Jacob was home cooking stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. Jacob replied, first, sell me your birthright. Look, I am about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? How many of you have kids here in this room? (laughs) Yeah. How many times have you heard that, eh? Right? If I don't get something right now, mom, I'm going to (laughs) die. But Jacob said, swear to me first. So, I, so Esau swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. And in the Bible. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. So he despised and he gave up his birthright. 
So I think in order to understand this fully, we really need to talk about what a birthright is, particularly back in this ancient time. So the birthright, it belonged to the oldest son, and it was included as in the important right, responsibilities, honors, and inheritance one would receive by being the father's oldest son. It was something that was not only expected, but it was of utmost importance for the family and the functioning of the family unit and this continuity in ancient culture. See, friends, a birthright was never something that was to be casual or flippant about that you were going to receive. So here we have this story about Esau and Jacob. They're young men at the time. Their father isn't even close to having have passed on. And it's this impulsive moment. Esau gives up his birthright. Gives it over to Jacob, his brother, for a bowl of soup. And then the Bible makes it clear that he despised his birthright. The inheritance, the blessing, the honor. Now, you know what I find that interesting about that passage? Is that when we read it, At the very end of that story, it says, so Esau despised his birthright. Did Esau actually despise his birthright? Or is this the writer saying, look what Esau did. Clearly, he despised his birthright. Because if it was that of much importance and honor as it was back in the day, he could never have possibly just done this for a bowl of soup. That's how I think we need to look at that passage and that particular one when he makes that comment. So we know that Esau just gave up his birthright and he despised it a lot. Now, I know what you may be thinking at this point, because as I read that passage, I thought the same thing too. Well, maybe the birthright actually wasn't worth anything. Like who cares, right? Maybe it was like, yeah, here's here, son, here, I'm going to pass you down here. I've got this, you know, collection set right now of Encyclopedia Britannica, and uh, you're going to really love this. Oh, yeah, great. Yeah. I think I'd rather have a bowl of soup, right? So you may be thinking that, right? Or maybe you're thinking to yourself, okay, if I think of this as an inheritance or some sort of, you know, family business being passed down. Maybe I don't even like my family. Maybe my family, we hate each other. And so the idea of actually even getting this or taking, it's not something I want because I don't like my family at all. And I hate them, right? But the Bible says that's not the way he was. He says he was loved by his dad. Loved by his dad. It also goes on to say this in the Bible, as we continue on in the story, is that the birthright, while it's not explicitly clear how much it was, it was enough that the surrounding people of, of the estate, okay, we'll call it that, surrounding people of the estate, so other tribes, other countries that were around, they actually wanted them to move out of there because they were getting, becoming so wealthy and so powerful. Think of it like this. It's like when Costco came to town, right? And all the businesses like, we don't want Costco here in Sudbury because they're gonna wipe us all out, right? It's the same sort of idea of what was happening in this story of Jacob and Esau. The estate was worth a lot of money. He was loved. We knew what that Esau gave up was a lot. And when we think about this story, he's literally not dying because he misses one meal, is he? As much as our kids do that to us as well, right? They're not dying. So, you know, when, as I was thinking about that, I don't think we'll ever know the process of what was going on in his mind at the time. Only that he felt his birthright was worthless. To be so immediately discarded for this satisfaction of a meal. So, years pass, and the family estate, the business grows, and it grows because of God's blessing upon Isaac, the family, the father, and he's at the, near the end of his life, and he's about to pass on his estate, his inheritance blessing, and here's what happens in the next part of the story, and this is Genesis 27. Just before you came in, and this is Isaac speaking to Esau, I blessed Jacob, and indeed he will be blessed. When Esau heard his father's words, he burst out with a loud and bitter cry and said to his father, bless me, me too, my father. But he said, your brother came deceitfully and took your blessing. Esau said, isn't he rightly named Jacob? And what that means, Jacob, grabbing the heel, he's the deceiver. This is the second time he's taken advantage of me. He took my birthright and now he's taking my blessing. Then he asked, 
Haven't you received, reserved any blessing for me? Isaac answered Esau, I have made him lord over you and have made all his relatives his servants and I have sustained him with grain and new wine. So what can I possibly do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, do you have only one blessing, my father? Bless me too, my father. Then Esau wept aloud. So, you know, we can't fully understand because the Bible doesn't say why didn't Isaac just change it, right? Why didn't he actually just say, okay, forget what I just did. Let's bless Esau. Now, we don't really understand that point, but I don't think that was the point of the story in the Bible. What we see in the Bible and what we're, we're evaluating is the consequences of making a rash decision and the fallout from that decision that changed the entire course of his future. So remember when I said, why do we talk about villains, tragic characters in the Bible? It's because they stand out for warnings for all of us, right? What not to do in our lives if we choose to do certain paths and decisions for ourselves. And what might happen in, with the consequences of doing that? So, you know, when I see this story and I think about what happens with Jacob and Esau and Esau just turning over his birthright, what he's entitled to, his inheritance and the responsibilities, the blessing that goes along with that. I see this story and I thought of two things for all of us. You know, I can't possibly apply this to my life. Like I don't have, my family doesn't have a family business. We're all poor. We don't have any money. I'm not going to get anything when, I die, when my parents die. So how could I possibly apply this to my life? I mean, it, it, it's sort of senseless to me, right? But here's what I want you to think about for a minute. I fully believe all of us have a birthright. Each one of us. And while it may not be the birthright that we think of in this story of this tangible business that's getting passed on to us, there's a spiritual and a soul birthright that each one of us have, all of humanity has. And this is what it is. We were created to be children of God, called God's children. You know, it says in 1 John 3, 1, this, see how much the Father has loved us. His love is so great that we are called God's children. So now remember when I said, like, uh, this is for all of humanity, that this birthright is. And let me, I want you to follow my thoughts here on this. So right at the beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, it says this. And God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. He's talking, this is the Trinity we're talking about, right? There's not like lots of gods up in heaven. This is God, God, the father, God, the son, God, the Holy spirit. Let us make human beings in our images to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth and the small animals that scurry around the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female he created them. So when we read that passage, you might be thinking, so, oh, okay, so now I, I guess I'm a God as well, and I just need to rise to the occasion like I can wor- will up the willpower to become some sort of God. And that's what the Bible is saying here, friends. Let me, let me finish off my thought here. And this is in the New Testament, in Ephesians 4, 24. Let the Spirit change your way of thinking and make you into a new person. You were created to be like God. You see, when God created humanity, I was, I was reflecting on the fact, like, why did God create humanity? Why do I exist? Why do we exist? Why do human beings exist? And God himself makes it very clear at the very beginning of the Bible because he wanted humanity to be a reflection of who he was. He wanted humanity to be a reflection of who he was. So that humanity was meant to show other humans, this is how you're supposed to be. The idea that God is love and and this ultimate goodness, that was meant to be a, we as humans were meant to reflect that for other humans. 
You see, when I think about this idea of giving up our birthright and how I think all of us at times have done this, and maybe we're in the process of doing it, I think it's because we abandon and don't fully embrace the reason why we are alive. You see, even this idea that God created humanity and this image of who God was to be like God, it also, how were we actually meant to do that? It was meant to, to how were we going to ever learn to be what, who God is or reflect him? It was because it was coming from a place of a relationship. If you remember in Genesis that God created, and then he talks about creating uh, Adam and Eve after he said, so humanity has been created. And then he says, and it is good. So, so this idea that he didn't just create Adam and Eve, humanity, he didn't just create that and let us go and say, well, this is the reflection of me. He created that, and then he was intimately involved with them in the Garden of Eden, so that he was in relationship with them. That was why he created humanity, so that he would be in relationship with us, and we would then reflect that relationship that we have with God to others around. Now, because of the fall of man, or we turned away from what God's original intention was for all of us, it corrupted that reflection. How, how many of us, and we can all admit to this, right? We do things that aren't great all the time. That when we, sit, when we think about, well, you know, I did this action. Would this be the most highest good or the best thing? Or maybe this is a selfish moment. And that's probably not what God would want. Well, that was a result of the fall of man, of sin coming into this world. And so now we have this darkened reflection in humanity of what our original intent, what our original purpose is of being alive. We, it severed this relationship that was supposed to be what God wanted for us. But friends, hallelujah, we can be reunited again. And we can begin to go back to the reason why we exist, why we are created. Here's what it says in 2 Corinthians 5.21. And this is in the New Testament. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. You see, friends, we can't be back to what our original intention was because of that corruption that has happened in our world because of the fall of man. That scripture tells us we can get back there, but only through Jesus. Jesus, the one that was an offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. So friends, when we want to reclaim that birthright, when we think about we've given that up, we can grab that back again. That birthright, that inheritance, that purpose of what we are supposed to be, and then reflect that image of God to others around us and, and fully claim the purpose for our lives through Jesus. That's who we can find and reclaim that birthright back through. You know, and as I was thinking about this as well, not only that part of it, but how we at times might surrender the birthright that God has created for us is this. I, th I think, God, you know, Jesus, I am following after you, Jesus, so I have claimed my birthright, but, but I, think, I think at times, friends, we also don't fully claim back and declare all of those promises and affirm those responsibilities of our inheritance. If you inherit a family business, you know, you don't, it may be worth millions of dollars, but you still got to figure out how to keep the doors open, right? Like there's still responsibilities that are involved when you inherit or you grab your birthright. It's so different than when we grab back our birthright of being sons and daughters of God. There's, there's responsibilities and there's promises with it. Think about this for a minute. I mean, how many times have we maybe sacrificed our birthright for a bowl of soup. You know, your, your birthright is that you have access to God through prayer, prayer because of Jesus. You have access to God through, through prayer because of Jesus. Think about the, how profound that is. Like all of us have access to God through prayer because of Jesus. We can talk to God of the universe that created us uh, wants and desires a relationship with us. But how many times do we not actually claim that power that God has given for all of us? 
that birthright that you and I have. That we might pray and ask not only to, 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 not only to have relationship with God and, and be in intimacy with him, but also petition God through prayer on our behalf and friends' behalf and humanity's behalf. How many times do we not take that birthright that God has given us and we just try to do things on our own volition and strength? You know, there's a scripture in Philippians 4, 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So I think the question is, when I, I think about this, have you, have I given up our birthright, that glorious access to God by not praying? Have you given over victory in your life over things that you know that God doesn't want you to be involved in because you haven't spent the time accessing that birthright of prayer? of speaking to God himself. I think that's one way that we just despise our birthright. I think another way that this story encourages me when I think about our birthright is, have, have, I, have, have we given up our birthright in not, in not affirming the promises of God, and not affirming the promises of God? Let, let, me hear, let me explain what I mean. You know, there's parts of the Bible where, where God has a promise and a blessing for us if we follow his ways, right? And if we decide to engage in short-term pleasure, we miss out. Let me just think about the idea though, of fear. You know, in the Bible, it says almost 365 times, it talks about fear and not being afraid. Different variations of that thought. 365 times it talks about fear and not being afraid. That's a promise that God has for us. Do not be afraid. I am with you. And I wonder at times when I, I, when I think about that birthright and that promise, do I really believe what God is saying? Don't be afraid. Do, have I surrendered control of my life to the point where, where I, can, I can rest in the promise of, of, of peace in my life and joy in my life and, and courage in my life because of the relationship that I have with God? Or do I at times think I can do a better job than God can in taking control of all of those things in my life that I need to be surrendering to him? Don't be afraid. Do we believe that? My birthright, God, is you're promising this to me that I don't need to be afraid. I don't need to be afraid of the future. God, you are in control and you got a path and a, and a purpose for all of us in life. If I surrendered that because of not believing it, thinking I can do a better job, or have I surrendered at the times when I think about my, my birthright, have I, have I surrendered the promises that God is, has for living out a life of holiness in my life because I don't, I want the short-term pleasure of doing it my own way or in a secular way? Have I given up my birthright for that? You see, friends, I think all of us at times can do that. And yet, Jesus, you just remind us, and your Bible continues to remind us about, don't be afraid. Psalm 23, it says this, even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid. For you are close beside me, your rod and your staff, they protect and comfort me. I'm going to say it again, friends. Have we decided to accept the promise that God has, or have we traded it in for worry and the misgotten belief that we can control everything? You know, we, we had our communion, or we had our offerings that, just before we preached. God, God, I can't possibly be generous because I don't know what the future is going to have. And if I don't, if I'm not generous, then at least I'm in control. I mean, God, how can you possibly ask me to live the way you're asking me to live? It's not unlike Esau, is it, right? He gives up his future for immediate gratification. And it, and it goes back to what Jesus says too, right? 
we look at we look at the Old Testament through the eyes of Jesus. Jesus himself says, what does it profit a man to gain the world but lose your soul? You see, Esau selling his birthright, it indicated this lack of respect for his, his position, his privilege in which he obtained. His careless treatment of his God-given blessing shows his true focus was on temporary desires over a lifetime of blessing. See, friends, that is the lesson of the story of Esau for all of us. Don't give up your birthright. Embrace it and walk in it. So I want to ask the question of you again in a different way that I asked earlier. And I'd ask the worship team to make their way back up. Would you give up a million dollars for the business, the family business? Nobody said anything, right? I want to reframe it. And I think what God is asking all of us, will we reject the glorious inheritance that God has given you? Will you reject the glorious inheritance that God has given you? The promise of blessing, the intimacy of relationship, the future hope of a glorious eternal future, and the trust to not be afraid. Will you reject your birthright? Let's pray. And we're just going to begin to prepare our hearts for communion. And if you would get your communion elements ready, if you're online watching us, maybe you're on the radio listening, grab your communion elements because we'd like to go to communion. But I want to ask just in this moment as we're going to pray, I want to just remind us of a story that's in the New Testament. And it was the parable of the, the prodigal son. You know, there's a story about the son that also lived in a well-off family and had all the privileges of being there. And he gave it up to pursue pleasures that eventually he found got him into a place where all he could do was live in a pig stall. I mean, it's not hard when we hear that story to realize that at times we've made decisions for our own lives that lead us to the same place of being stuck in, in, in a stall full of pig crap. You know, he surrendered his birthright as well to be part of a loving family, to be involved in the blessings of, of the, the life that he was living, all to give it up for temporary pleasures. He sacrificed his birthright. But you know the wonderful thing about that story is that the father invites him back home. So even at times, friends, that story tells me is that when I sacrifice my birthright, when I don't pray and access the power of God that, you, that is available for me because of how and who you created me to be, when I don't do that, Lord, when I... When I when I cling to fear about my future and, and try to control things around me more than surrendering control to you. When I, when I don't trust God at times when you're asking me to be generous and, and I don't do it because I, because I need to have that money because I don't know what the future looks like, just like Esau. Lord, you remind me in that moment, just so the prodigal son about giving up the birthright that there's always redemption to be found. That God, your hands and your arms are open wide. And even when I surrender those things that I was created to be, I could come back to you, Father. And that there's, there's, I'm not so far away that your arms aren't always open and wide and waiting for me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I just pray for myself and for all of us here, Lord. Help us to embrace our birthright, Lord. Fully, all in, every part of our being. I would ask, Lord, that it would envelop us a purpose of which we were created, relationship with you, and to reflect your image in this world, Lord. Let those two things be at the top of my mind and my spirit at all times. And Father, I pray on behalf of each person here 
that has never heard these words before, never even considered the fact that they were born for something else. They are born for a relationship with you and that only that can be accessed by surrendering our hearts and our spirits to Jesus Christ. You are Lord of all. Maybe you're here in this place right now and you're listening to my words as we pray and you're like, I've never done that before. I'd ask you right now, won't you pray with this with me? It says in the Bible that if you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and you confess with your lips that he rose from the dead, you will be saved. It's not a magic formula. It's a condition of the soul, friends. I would ask that you would pray with me. You'd maybe take that first step in this journey of reclaiming the birthright that you were meant to be living out in your life. And you've never done this before. Won't you pray with me right now? And you could just do it silently in your mind, in your spirit, or maybe just very whisper the words. This is an intimate moment between you and God. Please pray with me. Jesus, please forgive me of my sins. I want to follow you for the rest of my life. I surrender my soul, my pride to you. And I want you to be Lord of my life. You know, that's the first step in a journey of following after Jesus for the rest of your life. It changed my life. It can change your life as well. If that was something you prayed today, I want you to come and talk to me at the end of the service. We'd like to partner with you and see you grow in your relationship with Jesus that you started today. And for those of us that have followed Jesus for a long time, but are just feeling like, yeah, you know what? I haven't lived up to the birth rate that I was created to do. God, please forgive us. Help us, Lord, just to be a better reflection of who you are in our lives and for the sake of others around us. We pray this in your name. Amen.